Welcome, Matob. Please tell us about your professional background and what qualifies you to write a book about dietary supplements. Well, thank you, Ariel, for having me. Um, as far as my professional back background goes, if I start with um, you know educational background, I have a doctor of pharmacy um, from UCSF, University of California in San Francisco, and I also completed a residency in clinical pharmacy. And pretty much for the past 27 years, I consider myself a researcher, a basic scientist and a clinical scientist. Um, and the goal of my research has always been to improve human health. And I have interacted with patients um, in the hospital, in outpatient settings, um, with friends, uh, family, who always, always ask me questions about dietary supplements. So that's for the educational background. And when it comes to you know, professional background, again, I have worked in hospitals, I have worked in outpatient settings. I had a little detour from academia and I work for a pharmaceutical company, Abbott Laboratories, as a scientist and eventually a senior research scientist. And although I was focused mostly on pharmaceuticals, but I have always had a deep interest in dietary supplements. And 17 years ago at the University of California in Irvine, I set up a lab and I used uh, Fruitfly as my model system to study lifespan and health span. And uh, what I've been testing for the past 17 years in my lab is mostly dietary supplements and botanical extracts with the goal of improving human health. And you may wonder why fruit flies, um, because fruit flies share about 75% of our genes. So the idea is that if I discover something in my lab when it comes to the uh, impact of dietary supplements or botanical extracts on longevity, um, I should be able to kind of take that knowledge to clinical studies and um, test them in humans. And I also um, have launched a new center at UCI, the Center for uh, UCI Center for Health Span Sciences. And again, the goal of the center is to educate the public about modalities to improve health span. Why did you write this book? I wrote this book as a public health service because during my academic career, I have always been getting questions about dietary supplements. I have seen firsthand how good they could be and how harmful they could be. So based on all these questions and also the clinical and research experience, I decided to write this book um, to kind of inspire and educate the public about the correct use of dietary supplements so that we pay attention to what we take, um, how to monitor it, make sure that they are not interacting with the other pharmaceuticals or drugs that we are taking, and if they have any side effects, uh, so that we, we are able to detect them. What should government do to improve the regulation of dietary supplements? So I'm so glad you said what should government do to improve. The, um, so a lot, because right now, as you know, um, the industry is not uh, regulated. And what I mean by that is that the regulation starts after the dietary supplements hit the market. So really, when it comes to assuring the safety of the supplements, the burden is on the public. So to improve what government is doing, a good place to start is to start regulating them. Um, because as you know, FDA has rigid regulation when it comes to pharmaceuticals and the drugs that get on the market. So a good place to start is to start looking at the quality, safety, and efficacy of these products before they hit the market. Why are dietary supplements not held to the same standard as prescription drugs? That's a very good question, and I can give a, probably a one-hour lecture <laughs> answering this question. But uh, the quick answer is that it all started in 1994 when uh, a law was passed qualifying vitamins, minerals, um, you know, herbals as uh, substances that are supplementing our diet. So once this, this law was passed, it was almost the floodgates were open, 
and the number of dietary supplements, I wish I could say doubled or tripled, but they increased exponentially because there was no regulation and um, pretty much anybody could manufacture and sell a dietary supplement. So that's one of the reasons that we have so many dietary supplements and it is a very lucrative business because again, the regulation doesn't happen before they hit the market. The industry is responsible uh, to assure that these supplements are safe and they have high quality. And the good news is that we do have um, dietary supplement companies who follow good manufacturing practices and they um, take care of the safety and the quality of their supplements, their products before they hit the market. But um, unfortunately, there are some companies that do not follow those good manufacturing practices. Can you tell me about your personal experience using dietary supplements? I did a blood test a few years ago and I was low on EPA and vitamin D. So I started taking uh, fish oil and vitamin D supplements and um, I was able to increase my EPA levels eventually with a good diet, uh, adding more fish and seafood um, to my diet. But my vitamin D levels, regardless of what I do in my diet, usually remains low. And I am, I'm pretty active. I, I think I get enough sun exposure. So I have a real case of um, vitamin D deficiency. So I have to supplement. So I take about 2,000 units twice, two or three times a week. And um, every time I have my um, checkup, I make sure that I'm checking the vitamin D level to make sure that I am in the you know, uh, normal range. Do we need to take supplements to live a healthy life? Good question. We do need to take supplements if we need them. So I'm going to focus on the need because for the most part, we take the supplements that we don't need. And uh, what is a good way to find out is to do a blood test uh, to make sure that you're, we are not deficient on the vitamins, on the minerals. And if we are deficient, then we need to take them. Because if then we don't take them, we are impacting our health in a negative way. What is wrong with the media's role in promoting dietary supplements? Many things are wrong, but the good news is that we also have responsible media outlets that um, really promote the correct use of dietary supplements. Um, and I would like to add to this that although we do have those media outlets, but we also have you know, media outlets that are sometimes creating a hype when it comes to the dietary supplements. And um, sometimes what they portray as science is not science. Then you add to these media outlets um, what celebrities, for instance, endorse when it comes to the dietary supplements. And, and most of us don't do the due diligence to look for good research and high quality research. And if we read something on the me in the media and social media, we take it as science. Uh, and if, let's say, a media outlet is uh, promoting supplement X because it's going to improve your immune system, and if supplement X is also endorsed by a few celebrities that we like, then we, the chances are we are going to run to the store or go on the, on the website, the website of the manufacturer and order it. How do I know what kind of dietary supplements I should take? Really, a good place to start is a blood test. So you go to your physician, to a primary care provider, and you ask them to do a blood test to not only check your regular stuff, and by that I mean blood chemistry and um, some of the enzymes um, that you can, you can have an accurate, uh, get accurate information based on a blood test, but also the level of some of the nutrients that you need, some of the vitamins, the minerals. So that's a good place to start. Um, for instance, um, I give you an example of B12. Some people are deficient in B12, and the very overt symptom of B12 deficiency is fatigue. You may feel tired, you may feel fatigued all day, and that's a, that's a very easy test to do. You do a B12 level, and if your levels are low, the chances are you need to supplement with vitamin B12. Tell me about the science behind understanding the efficacy of dietary supplements. So the good news is that we do have good scientific publications on the efficacy of dietary supplements. And I would say over the past few decades, 
uh, the science has improved. Um, National Institute of Health, Office of Dietary Supplements at NIH, and other government agencies have uh, started to systematically fund studies that look at the impact and efficacy of um, dietary supplements. So um, a good place to go are these websites that I just mentioned, NIH.gov, uh, and also the uh, Office of Dietary Supplement or the ODS uh, website, which is inside the NIH. And you can find good, high-quality research on the use of dietary supplements. The problem is that we don't have too many controlled and high-quality studies. And what is sometimes portrayed in the media and in, on the Internet as science is not really science. I, I call it uh, pseudoscience. And there's a chapter in the book about the science of dietary supplements, and I go not, I, not that in-depth, but I go pretty in-depth uh, discussing the science behind um, supplements. What do in vitro experiments prove? Very interesting you ask that question because sometimes the science that we find on internet or in media or social media is based on in vitro studies. For instance, if I want to do an antioxidant experiment, the easiest thing to do is to do an in vitro. So I am going to look at the, look at the impact of uh, the antioxidant properties of a bunch of fruit supplements um, in, in, in vitro, and I'm going to measure the antioxidation levels of these products. It could be a fruit, it could be pomegranate, or it could be a dietary supplement such as vitamin C or vitamin D. And I have a number, I get a number, but that number was, is based on an in vitro study. An in vitro study, as the name implies, is something that was done in a petri dish, in a, in a flask. Uh, it's not in vivo. And in vivo stands for in, in a living organism. So the in vitro studies are a good place to start the science. So many biomedical um, discoveries were based on in vitro studies. But that's a good place to start. That is not, that experiment is not going to give you a full answer when it comes to humans and what will happen in a human body. Why is it important? It is important because you have to start somewhere. And I, I, I give you a very hypothetical example. Let's say I want to look at the impact of a pomegranate extract or a botanical extract on the um, oxidation state of my body. So I want to see if this, this uh, product, pomegranate for instance, has antioxidant properties. So I start with the in vitro. So I test it in an in vitro model to see if it has any antioxidation properties in a cultured cell model, in an in vitro model. And if I find anything in that model, then I'm going to repeat that study in a living organism. Usually we start with, you know, with animal studies, with mice, in my case, fruit flies, and then we move to um, human studies. But the problem is that sometimes the in vitro um, findings cannot be replicated in living organisms. So that's why I keep saying that it's a good place to start, but we can't stop there. So sometimes we read on media you know, based on science, based on scientific mm -hmm. studies, uh, this dietary supplement uh, has antioxidant properties. If it's based on in vitro studies, it may really not need much. And something else that we have to keep in mind is that the in vitro, the, the in vitro model does not replicate the human body because it is in vitro, okay. right? It is done in a petri dish. It's not done in a living organism, in an animal or in um, humans. What does the label tell me that I need to know? So I'm thinking that you're talking about the label on the dietary supplement. Yes. So the label can give you a lot of information. The label is supposed to tell you what is exactly in that bottle. So let's say you go to a store and you buy a bottle of a dietary supplement. If you read the label, the label should tell you exactly what is in that bottle. The label should also tell you about the active and inactive ingredients that are in that dietary supplement pill. Let's say it's in the pill or uh, capsule format. The issue is that FDA does not regulate or does not monitor or check that label before it's on the uh, bottle, before it gets on the bottle. And I have done studies actually in my lab looking at the ingredients of 
what is claimed to be in some of these dietary supplements. And I was not able to find uh, those ingredients. So they are listed on the label, but I couldn't find it. Of course, in my case, I work with botanical extracts and um, I have uh, tested botanical extracts where, for instance, it was reported that you, you should have 14% of these botanical extracts in this dietary supplement, and I really couldn't find anything. And um, the label is supposed to tell you exactly what is in that bottle, but as I mentioned um, in the book, there are dietary supplements that are contaminated, that are spiced, for instance, uh, with chemicals and heavy metals that uh, we don't know about. So you, they, are, they are there, they are there, but we just don't know about them. Because again, nobody is really testing what goes in that pill or capsule before that dietary supplement gets on the market. That's nuts. What other advice do you have for the public about using dietary supplements? I would say the main advice is to make informed decisions is to make sure that the dietary sub. First of all, ask yourself a very basic question. Do I need to take this dietary supplement? Because let's say based on a blood test, um, you found out that you need to take D. You need to take a, a mineral. Then the next uh, question is, how can I find a high quality product on the market? And um, in, in this book, in my book, I do have um, recommendations at the end of a chapter where you can find you know, good information on how to choose a dietary supplement and where to find a high quality uh, supplement. And then after you have chosen your dietary supplement, you have to monitor it because um, my, my answer to the question of is this safe because it says natural is that if you see a physiological change in your body, if you see a pharmacological change, that means that that dietary supplement or botanical extract is working, which means that it is impacting your body at the cellular level, molecular level. So you have to be careful. So you want to make sure that you monitor the supplement. You want to make sure that the supplement is not interacting with your drugs, with the pharmaceuticals that you may be taking, or other dietary supplements that you are taking. Well, my mind is blown. Uh, thank you so much for writing this book. It was so interesting and easy to read. I, I really, really enjoyed it, and I'm going to recommend it to all my friends now. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us um, in print and in video. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, it, it, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Mm -hmm.